This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, visitors. Welcome, church family. We love being with you. Thank you for being here today. You know, the Bible says that no word from God is void of power. There's power when your lips speak God's words. You are loved. Amen. We're so glad you're with us this morning or evening, wherever you are. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Today, we're asking, Lord, that we can come boldly before your throne. Lord, we're asking you to hear our prayer, to help us in our time of need, to encourage us, give us fresh vision, forgive us of our sins and renew us. And we pray it all in the strong name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you, and so do I. Became the cornerstone of a whole new world. The stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone of a whole new world. The stone that the builders rejected. The stone that the builders rejected. The stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone. to the ground and suffer through the winter's cold only to rise right up again and there it seed a thousand fold the stone that the builders rejected became a cornerstone of a In preparation for the message, Isaiah 1, 16 through 19. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. 
learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. Hallelujah. Amen. Darkest 
Thank you for being part of our Hour of Power family. We're so glad you're worshiping with us today. Every day we receive viewer comments, prayer requests, and testimonials from viewers all around the world. Some with heartfelt prayers for my family and for the staff here, and some with testimonies about how they've been touched by the Holy Spirit. A recent testimonial talked about how her connection with God was strengthened by spending time in prayer after the sudden death of her father. Psalm 54, 2 says, Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. To be still and sit with the Lord in silence and solitude can be so gratifying and moving. It gives us a chance to really hear from our God and seek out what He is calling us to do, or not to do, for that matter. Yeah, the Lord beckons us to lean into His presence, open our hearts before Him, and be transformed by the renewing of our minds. As we seek Him first in our lives, His love naturally and effortlessly pours out within us and in turn through us to others. If you give God a little time every day, you'll be surprised at how your spiritual health will shine brightly. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, P.O. Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. All it takes is a minute of your time each day to connect with God, and you'll be on your way to an enriching relationship with Him. Hannah and I are truly grateful for you, and we're praying that you'll be consistently changed by the amazing grace of our Lord so you can reflect His glory to everyone you encounter. Thank you, and remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. Sonia Curry is an author, educator, and co-host of the podcast, Raising Fame. She raised two sons, NBA stars Steph and Seth Curry, and daughter, Seidel Curry Lee. After keeping out of the limelight for many years, Sonia is telling her story in her new book, Fierce Love, a memoir of family, faith, and purpose, and how her faith has always sustained her, even in challenging times. Please welcome Sonia Curry. Well, welcome, we're so glad to have you here. And uh, for those who don't know, all three of your children are super elite athletes. Um, your two sons, Steph and Seth Curry, are both uh, NBA superstars. I mean, I was so surprised that my, uh, some of my friends here didn't know my wife and my executive assistant didn't know who that was. And I was like, do you know who Joanna Gaines is? You know, or something, I don't know. <laughs> but I, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, a, it's a pretty awesome thing. I, I'm really interested in hearing your story. So first, let's begin there. Tell us a little bit about your faith journey and why you came to write this book. Well, my faith journey has really been one of submission and uh, submission to the merciful, gracious, and loving authority of God and realizing personally every day that the things that I may want, the things that the world can offer me or says they want to offer me or it wants to offer me will never give me the joy and peace that my soul longed for. And I've tried being in the, I've been in the world. Uh, in my book, I talk about at age 12, where I went through confirmation classes and it was time to get baptized. And I was like, uh, I'm not doing that because that means I can't have fun. <laughs> so, you know, my life going moving forward has just been every day waking up and saying, God, you know best. You are sovereign in life. And trust is the word that when he says, he will make known to me the paths of my life. And in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there is pleasures forever and ever. And so I just keep that close in my heart uh, every day. That's awesome. One of the things I love about your family is even though, you know, there's all of this fame and money and all of the things that go with being NBA superstars, your sons and your daughter, I mean, they have an obvious love for God and they are just like the, I, I think, and I know they're probably not this way, you know, they're not as perfect as they seem, but they really are, <laughs> the, you know, the ideal athlete that you want kids to look at. They're positive, they're, they seem to be great on the field, they're just, and they're really outspoken about their faith. Um, 
I think that's actually just an incredible thing in and of itself. It's an amazing accomplishment that with all of those thorny things that could have gotten their way, they still clearly love the Lord. Tell us about that. I mean, how, was it hard? Was it hard raising kids like that? Was it hard seeing them go into fame and money and worrying about, you know, their personal lives and things like that? I mean, absolutely it is. You know, have been a wife of an NBA player, yes. Things come at you fast and furious. But, you know, I always try to focus on the fact that we are no different than anyone else. Everyone is, is, has those same temptations. Um, and just relying on the foundation of the word and training them in the way that they should go, but then also understanding that it, that's all that we can do as parents is raise them the best that we can and, and trust God to take over and water the seeds that have been planted in them uh, and just constantly praying for them, God, constantly. I know you have said in the past that you've kind of been hidden in the background on purpose, but you've felt lately that you want to be out there more, more outspoken and tell your story a little bit. And that's a big part of, of your book, Fierce Love. Tell us about that. What, 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 what experience was it like going from kind of behind the scenes to coming, coming out in the public like this? And I don't know if I deliberately wanted to stay in the background or now coming out of the background or coming forward. You know, when God a fire in you and a purpose in you, you cannot do it. I mean, he will carry forth his desires in one way or the other. And if we choose not to do it, he'll give it to someone else to do it. So, you know, this book just came about organically three years ago and one door opened, next thing, next door opened, and it was seamless, and very organic. And this is the time. It was the perfect time. I, I didn't want to do it. I tried to quit several times. Um, but God was just like, no, you, you have to tell the story and encourage parents uh, in this journey. There's no instruction book for it, as you know. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, what encouragement do you think um, do you have for people, you know, that are trying to step boldly and kind of be, you know, have more faith in, in their calling in the way that you're kind of feeling it in, uh, in your life? Well, I would say this. Just do it. Just take it. And you know, God hasn't failed me yet. And that's my uh, testimony to just how uh, good he's been in my life. Is if I just take a step, it's scary. You doubt yourself. You worry what everybody's going to say and how they're going to critique you. And you critique yourself. Um, but just take a step. And he will meet you and he will carry you through. Yeah, amen. Well, uh, Sonia Curry, thank you so much. Her book is called Fierce Love. I really want to encourage you to get it, especially if you know someone that is wanting to step out bolder in faith, or especially if you know a basketball fan. Uh, check out the book. You'll love it. It's a great, uh, great story, and uh, we, we so appreciate you, Sonia, taking the time to be with us this morning in your busy schedule. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. You guys have a blessed day.
teaching me how to receive it. So let all the striving cease. See, this is my victory. shall confess that you are Lord and you are our champion God and we praise you we lift up our voices to you yeah if you know this sing it where you are and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing Thank you for being part of our Hour of Power family. We're so glad you're worshiping with us today. Every day we receive viewer comments, prayer requests, and testimonials from viewers all around the world. Some with heartfelt prayers for my family and for the staff here, and some with testimonies about how they've been touched by the Holy Spirit. A recent testimonial talked about how her connection with God was strengthened by spending time in prayer after the sudden death of her father. Psalm 54, 2 says, Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. To be still and sit with the Lord in silence and solitude can be so gratifying and moving. It gives us a chance to really hear from our God and seek out what He is calling us to do, or not to do, for that matter. Yeah, the Lord beckons us to lean into His presence, open our hearts before Him, and be transformed by the renewing of our minds. As we seek Him first in our lives, His love naturally and effortlessly pours out within us and in turn through us to others. If you give God a little time every day, you'll be surprised at how your spiritual health will shine brightly. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, P.O. Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. All it takes is a minute of your time each day to connect with God, and you'll be on your way to an enriching relationship with Him. Anna and I are truly grateful for you, and we're praying that you'll be consistently changed by the amazing grace of our Lord, so you can reflect His glory to everyone you encounter. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we.
We're so glad you're here. Would you stand with us? We're going to say this together. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with my neighbor. Thanks, you can be seated. Today I want to talk about the importance of not allowing shame to be seen or experienced in your spiritual life as a good or holy thing. Shame is not from the Lord. No matter how many scriptures we read, how many hymns we sing about saying God has taken away our shame, many of us, when we've messed up, we love to look at ourselves in the mirror and send a curse, send some blame, beat ourselves, I'm not patient enough, I'm not this enough, I'm not that enough. And although it is so important in life that when we mess up, we own it, that we repent, that we, we take responsibility for our lives, wallowing in shame is not God's plan and not God's best for your life. He did not give up his only beloved son and only begotten son that we would wallow in shame and agree with Satan or that we are some bad, horrible thing. No, God has set you free. He's forgiven you. He's made you righteous and holy. So today I want to encourage you to do your best and forget the rest. Do your best and forget the rest. I'm embarrassed to tell you a story. Uh, in 2006, I took part in an abs contest. <laughs> now, a little backstory: my, uh, my chiropractor, who is my dad's best friend, we went to him my whole life, my brother and I would go to him all the time. And of course, he was always trying to encourage us to eat well and exercise. And of course, we completely ignored his advice. But uh, every year, he had this thing with his friends and some of the people that went to his clinic where he'd do this abs contest. And the goal was for these men to lose weight, you know, going into the summer. And so we heard about this, and we decided to join. So my brother and I signed up. And basically what happens is after Easter, everybody puts 50 bucks in a pot. And whoever has the best abs in July gets the whole kit and caboodle. So it was like 15 weeks or something where I was working out and I was dieting and I was doing all this stuff because I wanted to win this you know, abs competition. And I remember I asked my friend, Chris Jensen, a super athlete, he is diced and shredded. I mean, the guy is like, he does super marathons, which is where you run like 100 miles and kind of one sitting. And he said, here, he like on a PDF and on an Excel sheet gave me all the meals and exercises I should do. And he said, basically for your exercises, just do P90X. And I said, what's P90X? And he goes, you know, it's this. And I got to know this guy, Tony Horton. And I, I do not believe there was any way that a home DVD thing could get me in shape. I always, you know, I'm old school. I like iron, you know, I like deadlifts and squats and bench press, you know, and this guy was much worse, much harder. <laughs> and this was back in the days where they had this plastic disc called a DVD that you put into a DVD machine and it plays it. And at the bottom of that, there was like a progress bar. And right when it was getting really gnarly, right when I felt like my heart was going to explode, this guy, Tony Horton, would say, it's all right, pal, do your best and forget the rest. I really fell in love with this character. I'd never heard of him before, but he was always so like positive and friendly, and I found out later is a committed Christian. But he just loved to use this phrase, and it was burned into my mind, do your best and forget the rest. You'll be happy to know, know that the way that we judged in our abs contest is all these dudes got together in a gym, and we all took our shirts off and took pictures, and then we voted on who had the best shirt, which was a little bit strange. I will give that to you. That was 17 years ago. I wasn't a dad yet. But I got fourth place. So I had a six-pack, but it wasn't quite first, second, or third place good. But here's the picture. Just kidding. That is me and my brother <laughs> eating a three-foot-wide pizza 
That is the day after the competition. No more salad with no dressing for me. Both of us lost, but we were winners there. <laughs> I was curious to find out later, I saw, I think it was a TV show, Inside Edition, talking about T Tony Horton, because years had gone by, and I hadn't seen the commercials anymore. I hadn't heard of people doing P90X much anymore, and I wondered what had happened to this, this guy. What happened to him? I came to find out that he had actually fallen into a terrible sickness called Ramsey Hunt's syndrome. Now, a little backstory on Tony Horton. I believe he was born in like New Jersey or New York, some, some part of the East Coast. And you know, grew up with a heart for God, went to church with his family, but he was, this is what he called himself, a 98 pound weakling with a speech impediment. And when he got to college, he wanted to change his life. So he started exercising, working out. He enrolled in a weightlifting class at his college and got nice and buff and got rid of his speech impediment somehow and moved to California and started doing personal training out of his garage. And the training he did was so effective, he started to attract superstars. A long list of famous people went to see him. People like Usher and Bruce Springsteen. But uh, one that really stood out was uh, Tom Petty, who was uh, free falling when he was doing his exercises. You know, he was definitely in a struggle. But Tom Petty and Tony Horton actually became best friends, which I think is a sweet story. And uh, of course, Tony Horton became very successful in his own right. But um, as you may remember, in 2017, um, Tom Petty passed away from, I believe it was a prescription drug mishap or something, and it was a big surprise. And Tony Horton says that this was the thing that brought on the illness. It was a Ramsey Hunt syndrome, which is like a type of shingles. It comes from uh, chicken pox being in your blood, and, and it caused him to have, it's a shingles that attacks the nerves, I guess. I'm not a doctor, but it's something like this. It attacks the nerves, and it creates your, makes your skin feel like it's on fire in certain places, especially around the face. And he had one rash inside, I guess, inside of his ear, and so it affected his eardrum and it made him feel nauseous and in pain all the time, and this went on for years, and he just couldn't even carry on. And he said that the pain was like an 11 out of 10 all the time, and there was almost nothing he could do for two years. But in a classic story, of course, of course Tony Horton overcame, and he did his best, and he forgot the rest, I guess. you know, It's a, it's a sweet story. And actually, Tony Horton, if you're watching, I'd love to interview you and hear that story. What brought you through? But I'm, I'm going to guess that what brought him through is his relationship with the Lord. Because I don't know about you, but when I go through tough times like that, my mind goes to one place. I cry out to God, Lord, help me. And God hears us. And although it doesn't always go away right when we want it to, God's there with us. He carries us through. So I just want to use those words for you today. It's not in the Bible, but uh, it seems like something that would be in the Bible. Do your best and forget the rest. And I mean this in regards to your discipleship and the progress you have in life. You want to be a better husband or wife or parent or grandparent. You want to be better at the things you put your hands to, the labor of your life. You want to be better in your moral life. And you want to be better in your relationship with God. And in all of these things... There are times when we fall short and we want to look in the mirror and say, of course you did. You're such a mess up. You're such a this or that. Maybe you hear words from other religious people that you heard in your past that just said the worst, meanest, cruelest things to you. And you know, God does not say any of those things to you. He says to you this day, brush your shoulders off. Do your best. Forget the rest. He says to you, you are forgiven. You are redeemed. And most of all, you are loved. The saving work of Jesus Christ has made you into a new creation. And I say that to you today. How many times will God forgive you? It's a worthwhile question to ask. God will forgive you the same amount that he asks you to forgive your neighbor. 70 times 7 times 7 times 7 times 7. Well, isn't that prodigal? Isn't that, rec isn't that reckless? Isn't that unfair? And the answer is absolutely. It's literally a hack. It's a cheat code to your spiritual life. Not that we want to sin or we want to mess up, but we always have this thing we can lean on called the cross that wipes away our past and gives us a fresh start. So brush your shoulders off because God loves redos. He's into it. God loves seeing you pick yourself up after you mess up. 
Yes, we got to deal with the mistakes we've made and we need to take responsibility for our life, but God is rooting for you. God always sees your potential. God sees the best in you. What sort of farmer goes out into his field and looks at the crops and doesn't see the potential that lies before him or her? What sort of farmer says, gosh, I hope that tree doesn't get better. Gosh, I hope that tree doesn't bear any fruit. Gosh, I hope that it just stops growing, right? God does, would never say that. And he tells us in so many parables that it, as in a garden, that we ought to bear fruit. That that's what God sees within us is fruit bearing beings that carry forth his kingdom and his life. Stop wallowing in shame and live by faith in what God says about you. That you're redeemed, renewed, restored, forgiven. Brush your shoulders off. Do your best, forget the rest. No one else can see in your life what God sees in your life. A wise man once said, anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in a seed. You know what that means, right? You know what that means. Look at one little seed. I mean, you open up an apple, cut it open, you count eight, nine, ten seeds. But you look at a seed, God can see that thing and say, wow, there are thousands, tens of thousands of apples in my little hand right here. God can see you like that. He sees a seed so full of apples. All it must do is go into the ground and die and be nourished by the soil that it's in and be tended to by the farmer and it will bear Fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. Isn't that good news? That's what God wants from your life, is to die to your old ways, not to wallow in it, and to be made into a new creation. God is for you. He wants you to have a life-bearing, uh, a fruit-bearing life full of joy and compassion for your neighbor and not wallowing uh, in shame. It's in Isaiah... Chapter 1, we're going to read today. This is one of hundreds, literally hundreds of passages that just say you're completely new in God's eyes. Calls us to do what is right and calls us to see ourselves as God sees us. Pure as snow. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now. Let us settle the matter. He said, let's take care of this, right? Let's, let's sit down at the table and discuss. Says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things. Of the land. I love that passage. When the Bible talks about white as snow, it's not talking about some virtue about the color white, or of course it's not about race or anything like that. It's about the experience that you have when you see snow fall and it's laying fresh and powdery before you. Maybe you've gone up to Big Bear or Yosemite or one of the beautiful mountains we have, or wherever you're from, you've been to a beautiful mountain and in the morning it's been you know, dry and there's nothing there and then there's a windy sound over the night as you're sleeping and you wake up and you see the sunrise on fresh white snow. Did you know it snows in Jerusalem, by the way? Jerusalem's on, on a mountain, you know, a short mountain, but I think it's about 6,000 feet and it's, I'd love to go sometime and see the snow on Jerusalem. But of course, white snow means that it's flawless. It means that it's clean. It means you can scoop up a hand of it and eat it. It means you can take it and throw it as a ball into your sibling's face, and it's not going to get anything dirty in their eyes. But if you're walking around and you see snow that's a different color, say yellow. <laughs> Monsters, Inc., there's the adorable snowman. He's supposed to be the abominable snowman, but he crosses out and puts adorable, and he serves yellow snow cones. But he's like, no, no, they're lemon. <laughs> Very funny joke. Right, so if you see snow that has any color, whether it's red or yellow or anything else, 
it's not clean. But God says, your life, there is something about snow, isn't there? Like even the way it's the, everything sounds, it's just, it's lovely. And this is the image that God has for us, totally fresh, like a brand new, like a baby, that he creates a new life inside of you. You're forgiven, you're loved, and it, is, it really did happen for you. This is the importance and the difference between what the world offers and what the Lord offers. The best the world can do is say, you know, process it and move on. Oh, move on, move on with it. And the idea is that if you've done something bad or you have some trauma or something, you just sort of maybe talk it out and move on. And there is some benefit, of course, in talking about it, but that's not what the gospel is. The gospel is more than that. The gospel doesn't say just move on. The gospel says atonement, atonement. The gospel says what you did really was bad. It's not denying that maybe some of the things from your past that bother you, something you said or did or stole or whatever, that it's not that it wasn't bad, that it was bad, but it's saying that all of that and more died and was crucified with Christ. You literally traded places by faith in your baptism with Jesus, where he became all of those things that you don't like, that you, all of those mess ups, all of those things that you did, and, and you traded and you became a new creation. It literally was killed on the cross. It literally died and was hung up there so that you could be a fresh and new creation. And what, what this does for us in our soul that's different than what the world offers is if you just move on as a, as a secular person or whatever, you still have it in an unconscious place. Outside you're smiling, but you know you've got this thing inside. But as a believer by faith, you can literally say that person is gone, dead. It's dead. It's dead. Even if it happened yesterday, even if it happened in the parking lot here at church as you were walking in, you just give it to the Lord and he forgives. Isn't that amazing? What an amazing gift that is. What an amazing gift. It doesn't say, of course, that we should have contempt for that and just do whatever we want, but rather it says, don't feel shame, feel God's forgiveness, and then do your very best to live like Christ and to forgive your neighbor in the same way Christ forgave you. I want to tell you a story that's not very Presbyterian. Is that okay? Uh, I have a... I was with a good friend of mine, as a uh, very good friend, with him and his daughter out of state, and I was visiting with them, and he told me a story about demon possession. And he said, back in the 80s, you know, at this time, the guy is today, he's a successful businessman, but he does a lot of like parachurch type ministry things, praying for people and helping people that don't have a, pl a place to stay. He will give them, like, sometimes give them rooms in his house. But he was having this gathering worship service in his home. And there was a, a man who came in that he claims was a demoniac, a demon-possessed person. And that in the middle of this worship service, this person began to manifest. Am I freaking anybody out yet? This man began to manifest this demonic spirit to the point where he was writhing and screaming and foaming at the mouth. And it took four grown men to hold him down. And they were going to pray for him. And just before they did, this man that I was talking to said a little prayer over himself. He said, if I'm going to face this dark thing, he said, Lord, forgive me of my sins. He just wanted to go before this challenge of forgiven man. He said, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And as they began to pray for the man, the demon inside of this man began to call out all of the secret sins of the men that were holding him down. And this guy told me he had secret sins of his own that are now out in the open, but at the time nobody knew about it and would have been humiliating and embarrassing. And so this man that was being held down and being prayed for began to point at each of the three of the four men and started to call out specific hidden sins in their lives. But when he got to the fourth man, this man I was talking to, he didn't say anything. And so what he said, and his adult daughter was there with him, what he says is, I think because I prayed that way, he couldn't see my sin anymore. But his daughter rightly reached over and said, no, dad, it's not that he couldn't see it anymore. It's that it didn't exist. It didn't exist. Gone like that. 
That's the gospel. You see? That's the gospel. So simple, just a simple prayer. Lord, forgive me. And his, he just dying to forgive you. He just can't, like, that's all he needs. Boom, no problem, forgiven. Like, that is the heart of God. Isn't that such a gift? And it's no wonder you're God's beloved treasure. You're his child. It's no wonder he cannot wait to make you into a new creation, fresh, fresh snow, full of life, completely clean, completely forgiven, blank slate, your whole life before you. That's what God offers you. That's what God offers you. Won't you accept that? You know, there's nothing stopping you from right now just saying that prayer in your own heart right now. There's nothing, nothing stopping you from just quietly in your own way saying, Lord, forgive me. I'm dead to that old life. Make me a new person. Nothing's stopping you from doing that right now. And if you do that, something radical changes in the spiritual world that has an impact on the material world that we can see and measure. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin that you could be called the righteousness of God. Wouldn't it be weird to look in the mirror and say, I'm the righteousness of God? It doesn't feel right, does it? Makes it sound like because of what we do or our actions or we're perfect. No. I am the righteousness of God because almost like a spell was cast over me that all sins and chains and burdens, they were just broken and washed away in an instant in the blink of an eye, made completely new by the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. You are holy. Holy. Now, we don't like that word today. It's not a very modern word, is it? Holy? I am holy. Can I just say, first of all, that that the word holy actually, if we're splitting hairs, holy does not mean righteous. Do you know that? Holy does not mean righteous. The word kadosh does not, there's a Hebrew word that we often translate as sacred or holy, it does not mean righteous. Dennis Rodman, you remember him? Dennis Rodman is holy. Right, whoa, hold on. You remember Dennis Rodman? Talking about NBA players, if you don't know Steph Curry, you don't know Dennis Rodman, I suppose. But he's a guy that has like piercings all over, and he's you know he's got crazy hair and tattoos, and he wears like dresses and cusses a lot, and and he's like friends with Kim Jong Un, and he's just got he's just weird, right? He's got like a messed up life. Dennis Rodman is holy. You know why? The word holy doesn't mean necessarily righteous. It means separated. It means different. If you had one word for Dennis Rodman, the word would probably be unique, or even weird works. You know, Scripture calls us a peculiar people, a weird people, right? So holy does not necessarily mean righteous. It means that you're obviously different than everyone else. You're cut away. They know that you are different. This is why the Jews were commanded to do so many things that didn't really have a, a a moral sort of feeling to them. Like, why not? Why do I have to wear weird clothes and silly hats? And why do I have to do my hair a certain way? And why do I have to do all these things that don't necessarily make the world a better place? And the reason is because God wanted them to, be, to look different than the culture. He didn't want them to blend in. He wanted them to be different. That's what it means to be holy. And so holy in a biblical way does mean righteous, but it means that, that the righteousness you live, that the life you live, obviously... Everybody knows. Everybody knows you're different because who else would forgive their enemies in such a way? Who else would be full of so much faith and confidence in God's word? You see, it is so important. We live in a world, by the way, where I think everyone wants to be holy, you know? But the problem is, so like you see it in fashion and everything, everybody wants to stand out. Everybody wants to be unique. But if you want to be unique, just trust in the gospel. You're already unique enough in God. You don't need what the world has to offer. You've already got it all. And you don't need to beat yourself up anymore. See yourself the way God sees you. Testify to the fact that this thing given to us by our ancestors, this 2,000-year-old document, is true for you today, just as it was thousands of years ago, and it always will be. Depend on it and trust on it. So you say, Bobby, you still don't know, man, I messed up. And I just keep messing up. I just keep messing up, man. Don't beat yourself up. 
Yes, it is good that we have these moments in life where we face the music. We do have moments in life where we weep and we beat our chest and we cry out to God and we say, forgive me, I'm a sinner. And we, these are important moments, but they're meant to be only moments. That's not meant to be the way you live your life. You're, you're not meant to live constantly in a state of shame and beating yourself up. If I read the Bible right, you're supposed to live in confidence and faith that what Christ said happened for you really did. It really did happen for you. I wrote down some things here that the Bible says about you. And in no place does it say you should keep beating yourself up every day. Rather, it says we should confess that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Huh? That we should see ourselves the way God sees. You know what God sees in you? He sees a new creation, a partner in the glory of heaven. Abraham's seed, you're a soldier of Christ. You're led by the Spirit. You're the body of Christ. You're an heir to the promise of the covenant. You are God's beloved workmanship. You are a steward of the mysteries of the Most High. You are the house of the Holy Ghost. You are a king's child. You are the righteousness of God, and you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men and believe that it is true for you. It is. God is not ever called the accuser of the brethren. That name is reserved for the enemy. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And he just, I just wish there was a way I could communicate to you how much God just loves, loves to forgive and loves to pick you up and loves to see you making progress in your discipleship and in your life and in all the things that matter. He loves you so much. He does not love to withhold good things for you. He loves faith. He loves it when you trust him. He loves it when you do just so simply, just do the next right thing. He is so for you. His heart swells with life and love for you. And that is the good news. What good news that is. What good news it is. That, that truth has been veiled from us by by dark things, but God is even telling you now, my friend, God loves redos, so brush your shoulders off, uh, do your best, and forget the rest. Lord, we love you. We ask in Jesus' name that today we would really feel it. First we say, just forgive us, we ask. Forgive us and help us to forgive our neighbor the same way you forgave us. Help us to let go of our unforgiveness and bitterness that we have towards whatever and to live free from that and help us to know how much you love us, Lord, and help us know we don't have to figure it all out. Father, we love you and we thank you and we're grateful for the good work that you did for us. And it's in the strong name of Jesus we all pray. Amen. Well, thank you all so much for being here with us. Way to go. You put God first in your li life by gathering with his people at the beginning of the week. I just think your week's going to go better because you did that. And I'm so, so glad you were here. Come back again next week. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for being part of our Hour of Power family. We're so glad you're worshiping with us today. Every day we receive viewer comments, prayer requests, and testimonials from viewers all around the world. Some with heartfelt prayers for my family and for the staff here, and some with testimonies about how they've been touched by the Holy Spirit. A recent testimonial talked about how her connection with God was strengthened by spending time in prayer after the sudden death of her father. Psalm 54, 2 says, Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. To be still and sit with the Lord in silence and solitude can be so gratifying and moving. It gives us a chance to really hear from our God and seek out what He is calling us to do, or not to do, for that matter. Yeah, the Lord beckons us to lean into His presence, open our hearts before Him, and be transformed by the renewing of our minds. As we seek Him first in our lives, His love naturally and effortlessly pours out within us and in turn through us to others. 
you give God a little time every day, you'll be surprised at how your spiritual health will shine brightly. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, PO Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. All it takes is a minute of your time each day to connect with God and you'll be on your way to an enriching relationship with Him. Hannah and I are truly grateful for you and we're praying that you'll be consistently changed by the amazing grace of our Lord so you can reflect His glory to everyone you encounter. Thank you and remember as always, God loves you and so do we.